everybody. Um, welcome to, uh, to today's event. We are talking today about um, storytelling in the medium of board and card games. Uh, I want to let everybody know that we are on Toast A in the Discord chat. So if you want to join us there, um, that'd be lovely. If you want to ask questions, I'm going to try to leave some time for that. So just please mark your questions with um, like a big all caps questions for the panel so I can find it easily. I want to start by introducing our two uh, guest panelists today. Um, I guess I should introduce myself as well. I, I'm Jonathan Stark, and I am uh, the creator of Alignment May Vary. We do Dungeons and Dragons stuff, a lot of it. Um, one of our most popular products is we run the podcast The Bestiary, where we look at monsters from the Monster Manual, uh, often with guest stars. Um, but I'm very excited today to introduce first Alex Schmidt. He is a longtime RPG player and the director of sales at Stonemeyer Games since 2020, uh, where he recently co-designed the game Red Rising, which is based on the trilogy of novels by Pierce Brown. In it, you play in a dystopian society divided by the caste system and are trying to rise to power without losing your head. Uh, it's an impressive undertaking to translate the complexity of a novel into a card game. So I'm super excited to hear your perspective on this uh, tonight, um, Alex. Yeah, and, thank you for uh, having me. I'm excited to be here. And also, I got to tell you, I love Stonemeyer games. I, you know, they, they just make great games. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also very excited to welcome renowned author Casey Lucas Quaid. She is the 2020 winner of the very competitive New Zealand Sir Julius Vogel Short Story Award and the author of a number of fictional stories, most recently The Meyer, which was first published for free online as a serial novel and has recently joined Wizards of the Coast as a writer for Card Text. Uh, she's an incredibly prolific writer. And if you wanna know more about her, I'm, I'm gonna drop a link at some point in the Discord. There is a wonderful interview with her over at the spinoff, um, which goes into her philosophy, writing challenges. And um, like many of her stories left me with important questions like your family raised homing pigeons? That, that's a thing, that's true? Uh, yeah, not only like uh, raised them, but we used to race them competitively. So there is a league of pigeon racers in uh, northern Utah, I think western Wyoming, southern Idaho, southern Montana, and a few of those um, kind of like weird western states in the U.S. that have a little bit too much space and a little bit too much free time, you know. So, um, yeah, we had a flock of about 30 pigeons and we used to drive them out into the middle of the nowhere and let them go and then time them to see when they would come back. And then if you have the <laughs> fastest pigeon, they take a picture of your pigeon and they put it on a little plaque and they're like, oh, congratulations, you have the best pigeon. And it's just it's it's honestly one of the most wholesome things that exists. So, see, we've got we've got very interesting guests tonight with a broad perspective. So I want to jump right into this um, and I want to ask you both a question. Um, today's today, tonight's topic is really trying to answer the question, how do you accomplish world building in a non-traditional medium? A medium that's designed to tell us not to tell a story, but to play a game. And when I tell people about a new game or someone selling a game to me, usually they don't start by explaining the rules. Usually they say, this is a game about magic, or this is a game where you play as lords of a city or bird watchers or whatever, or, or homing pigeon racers, whatever it will be. They tell the story first. And so my first question is, why do you think that is? And I think I'll start with, um, with Alex for this one. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is that humans are storytellers by, by nature through, whether nature or nurture throughout history, we have always been storytellers. We think and experience our world through the context of stories. We make stories about what what was my day like yesterday? What happened yesterday? I, I create that in, into a story. So in the context of a game, especially it's something you have to now quickly learn the rules of how to play so that you can not slow everything down and actually play, um, putting it in the context of a story immediately gives you a perspective to think about it. I, I'm doing these things and they make sense in the context of the story that I'm now playing in. And at the same time, it's engaging you which is like which piece comes first that's hard to say but and and casey do you have anything to add to that uh yeah i think i think you covered the the nature of storytelling and why we do it uh pretty well so i'll answer from kind of a more um 
explaining the nature of a game to a brand new person who hasn't played that game before. Um, like from a from a business perspective, there are really only so many types of game. And from a player perspective, there are only so many types of game that are different enough from each other that when you describe the really basic actions you take while playing them, uh, they would actually be any any different at all. So like if you were telling someone about a brand new game that you were playing and you were like, oh yeah, it's like, you know, you, you buy a bunch of cards and then you sit down with your friends and lay them down on a table. It's like, there's no point of difference there. That could be literally anything. So I think that we tend to focus on things like the story, the lore, the unique aspects, just because otherwise it just sounds like, oh yeah, we all, we all sit around a table and move bits of wood around. And it's just very, you know, you, you kind of you kind of have to differentiate yourself in some ways. It's it's it's, a, it's basically like you you don't tell uh you don't tell your friends when you're you know telling them about a movie that you just saw. Oh yeah, it was it was sick. We went to the theater and stared at a screen. Like you have to describe what it's about rather than just the act of what you're doing, so that people have any sort of frame of reference for what it even is. Now that's really interesting to me because um, as a long long term gamer and a, and a studier of game history. I see that like in the early days of gaming, it is more like let's play, let's lay some cards on a table, let's move some pieces. And then in, in today's gaming world, more and more and more story seems to have taken over. And so I, I'm curious if, if either of you um, have a per, uh, like an idea on really that evolution, like why, why do you think now more than ever where we don't want to play, you know, sorry, we want to play a game that has like some story behind it, some world building. Maybe I'll start with Casey this time. Uh, I just, I just want to say I, I actually really love Sorry. <laughs> oh, me too. No, no, don't games. get me wrong. <laughs> I'm not but, um, just sorry. Sorry, yeah. I'm not sorry. <laughs> I, will, I, I will not. I will not let you slander Sorry in front of me. Um, no, it's, that's actually a really interesting question because um, one of the things that I've done for the last few years is I have been a juror and a game selector for a few independent gaming festivals and uh, games awards, such as the New Zealand Game Awards and Indiecade. And one of the cool things about exploring some of the stuff that gets submitted to these festivals is... Um, you, you may you may not know about them and you may not hear about them and they may not become smash hits, but there are actually plenty of people still making brand new equivalents of like, sorry. And it's really fascinating to me um, why there tends to be this big explosion of story driven games um, and also, you know, this the kind of continual uh, evolution of uh, less story driven games. And I wonder if a lot of the reason why story games are becoming more popular these days um, is simply because there's a lot less gatekeeping in publishing and manufacturing than there used to be. There are so many ways that a person can write up a tabletop supplement and publish it online or publish it in print or get funding to get it printed or get funding to get a slick professional edition manufactured. And um, there used to be just so many more hurdles to jump over and now there aren't. Alex, I want to throw that question to you, especially as you know, you're the director of sales for for Stonemeyer, which I think has kickstarted uh, of some of its products and had to deal with right, that kind yeah. of modern. Yeah, what's um, your perspective yeah, so, on that? So yeah, Stonemeyer used to kickstart and we don't now, but uh, that's kind of a side side matter. Um, I, I would say that uh, Casey is is right that there are people are still making games. Like it's very hard to find a a story behind Dominoes or at the same time, um, like you look at chess or go, and there is some element of story, like very, very, very abstract, but there is some element of like war or this kind of like back and forth control, and you see a story coming out of those games. Um, and so, so there is this like presence of, even if there's not, you know, art on cards and like this like predefined story, there there is this element of the story that takes place over the course of playing the game. Um, that said, as far as uh, selling things go, it is much easier in the same way that it's much easier to tell tell someone, hey, let's come play this game about fighting monsters. It's much easier to sell this game about fighting fighting monsters than this game about moving this uh, piece of plastic 
uh, over this table and putting it a different place on the table. Um, like, like, it's just easier, right? Like, it's, it's marketing. You have something to market there. Um, and that's because people are, once again, uh, connect to story. They, people care about story. And you said something in your answer there, Alex. You said that, um, you know, players create a story while they play. And I want to dig a little further on that. This this idea of you telling the story versus a player telling the story. Um, how is a as as a designer or or a magic card writer or or whatever you're you're uh, uh, you know doing in the world of game? How do you give players that freedom while still crafting an experience? Where do you draw that line? And we'll start with you, Alex. I mean, there's there's always um, I always want to give players freedom. Um, like they're, they're there to play the game, whatever game they want to play. Like if they don't want to follow the rules and they just want to play with the pieces, however they want, if that's fun. Great. Um, but as, as far as within the bounds of the rules, um, it kind of comes to sort of theme and, uh, experience, uh, the experience of, uh, flipping a card over on the table is different than the experience of rolling dice. Um, rolling dice is more, and, and this is just like one example, but ro rolling dice feels even though I'm not actually making any other like different decision than when I'm flipping a die, it feels like I'm more involved. Um, or, but flipping a card gives me this feeling of something unexpected is going to happen. Um, and so we get to start getting like those experiences of this feel, a feel of, of what's happening, and pe people latch onto those and start adding story to them. And so with a little bit of art and thinking about like, what is the theme of this game? What is the, the sort of player experience I want? Um, you can give them the tools, um, and then it kind of just depends on what the game is and what you want the experience of this specific game to be, how much you're writing a novel for them to read through over the course of the game, or if you have a few magic cards that have flavor text that they may or may not read, depending on the player. And, and Casey, anything to add to that? Uh, I think that Alex really hit the nail on the head um, when he said that it's about giving players tools to kind of do what they want. Basically, when you're designing a game and you're when you're designing the pieces of a game, um, you are filling up the player's toolbox with what they're going to be able to use to tell the story that they want to tell or to tell the emergent story that naturally emerges as a consequence of gameplay. And um, I also work in video games and it's very, very similar to me to sort of like the physics engine of your video game. You are establishing the world in which players can move. You are establishing the constraints that bind their behavior. You are establishing the rules, not the rules of the game, but the rules of the world. And um, basically as a, as a game designer, as a flavor text author, uh, and as a, you know, a GM in some games as well, it's just sort of your job to lay those things down and then to reinforce them when players make certain decisions. And then what happens from there is up to the players. And that's cool as hell. So do you approach, um, do you approach game design with a story first? Or do you approach with a design first and then sort of figure out what the story could be to, to wrap around that design? Oh, that's a... That's a tough one because I think I've done it both ways in the past. Um, I know uh, I was at a game jam last year uh, called the Golden Cobra Challenge, if anyone here has heard of it. And if you haven't heard of it, I recommend Googling it because it's fantastic. And um, the game I designed for the Golden Cobras, I started with a, a mechanic in mind, which was what I wanted. I wanted it to be a game that could be played specifically over video conferencing software, like Zoom or Google Hangouts or something. And I wanted the chief mechanic um, for storytelling to be that as the game progresses, events occur in the game that cause a timer to start. And when that timer runs down, the feed of one person speaking on your group call gets cut and no one else finds out what happens to them after that. Basically, you um, you get a random event that indicates um, a, a quick, quick explanation of the plot behind the game. Um, every, everyone who is uh, a player in the game is a member of a conspiracy group or a heist team that has just broken someone out of like whatever futuristic sci-fi fantasy jail of your choosing. 
and you are convening one last time after the jailbreak to congratulate each other on a job well done. But then you find out that someone sold you out and the space feds are on the way and they're coming for your group one by one and the feeds just get beep, 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 as the game progresses. And all of that sprang from just wanting, I was just like, I, I think it would be cool if there was some sort of a game where you knew you only had two minutes left to interact with this person and their character. And that impetus was just sort of like, you're running out of time. You have to, you have to do what you want to do very, very quickly. Um, but other times it's more like, I want to design a game where you drive a train. <laughs> you know, it's just very, like, it's totally different depending on the project. I love that. I love the idea of that game, by the way. That sounds very cool. And, and Alex, uh, your, your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um. I personally tend to go with the what what is the what do I want the player to be doing? What do I want the story to be first? Um, and then try to find the mechanisms around that. Um, that's completely selfishly because I find it more fun to design a game from that perspective because I am hooked into the game uh, sooner than. Um, but like there's there's nothing wrong about doing it one way or the other for sure. Um, and especially if you find a really cool uh, mechanism like what Casey described, like that's sounds fascinating and like finding a way to work that into a story similarly would be absolutely amazing. Do you think there's a different um, skill set between game design mechanics and storytelling in game design? I mean, do you, do you rely on, do you find like you need a team of people to really pull that together into a cohesive whole? Or it, do you think it's like a, it's a, a one man, a Renaissance man kind of title, you could do it all. I'll, I'll let uh, I'll let uh, Alex uh, start this one. So, I think that um, to have the best possible result, you want a team, um, because people like you have people bringing different experiences and sort of double checking each other. Um, is it possible for someone to be good at storytelling and at mechanics? Absolutely, um, and the board game industry is small enough that it's um, fairly uncommon to have a team, unless it's like a couple of people working together. Um, Wizards of the Coast Magic the Gathering is actually going to be one of your exceptions to that. Um, but uh, for the most part, like the the fact that um, I like co-designed Red Rising is actually abnormal. Um, usually it's one person uh, coming and doing these things. But when you look at the, you know, like AAA video game industry, obviously you have hundreds of people working on these. You have teams on the story, you have teams on on the mechanics. Um, and so I think the important thing is, or the answer is yes, they, they are different skill sets. One person can do both. Um, and whatever you're doing, you want the two to make sure that the two are integrating as you're creating the game and creating the story. Casey, your thoughts on that? Yeah, pretty much what Alex said there. Um, I have worked on projects where I have um, literally just been the only person other than the artist. Uh, I have done solo game jams where you just design the whole thing, including the art yourself, and your art always ends up mega ugly. Um, you have no idea how many dozens of people are involved in every single set of Magic the Gathering, though. So it's like you have the these two kind of diametric opposites. Um, and then, yeah, in, in video games, our team at uh, Dinosaur Polo Club, including our contractors, is 18 people, I believe. And um, people are always a little surprised that it takes that many people to make games that look as simple as ours do. But um, that's because it, it takes a lot of work to make things look simple when they're not. And um, I think that when you are working on any sort of design project that has a lot of complex moving parts, what's really important about needing more than one person's input is just kind of covering your own uh, natural blind spots and things you might not have thought of. And so even if you're working on a game uh, completely on your own, and even if you are doing a sort of uh, one man Renaissance guy project, I do think it's really important to get at least some external feedback in the early drafting stages, because otherwise you're just going to miss stuff. Like we're humans, we miss stuff. That's just how our brains work. 
Now I want to jump into some of your own individual experiences for a minute, because you both come from some different parts of the industry. Um, so Casey, I wanted to start with you when, when you're, I want to specifically talk about magic for a moment, because that's a really fascinating what you're doing. Writing cards for that is kind of a really interesting into that storytelling world um, in a very unique way. And so like writing for magic cards, it seems like it's the ultimate short story, like having to build an entire world in a in Twitter posts, you know, um, how, how does that process work for you? How do you decide what to write? How does that even start? Um, so interestingly enough, uh, every single, uh, like card game game that I have ever worked on has had a, uh, an approach where they consider the mechanics and they consider the art and then the flavor text is kind of the thing that comes last once those other two have at least been slightly, um, slightly designed, if not finalized. And um, that helps guide the flavor text a lot because basically you're you're in this uh, you're you're in the situation where the visual look of the card, the mechanics, the thing that the card actually does, and the flavor text they all have to be in sync. They all have to accurately reflect one another, but they all have to accurately reflect um, the source material from the story as well. So, like in Magic's case, you are reflecting the plane that the card represents. And um, yeah, it's a it's it's an interesting process, but it's it's not actually um, that tough if you think about it as kind of a um, sort of a, a tip of tip of the iceberg sort of approach. Like um, there there is so much world building and so much lore and so many stories that are written about the planes um, in which magic takes place. And so when you're designing a card, what you're really doing is you are just shining a teeny tiny spotlight on a part of that world, be it like a single sorceress action someone can take or a single creature or a single character or a single, uh, like in the case of a land card, it could even just be a single building. And so basically what you're doing is you're taking this um, this big piece of a pre-existing story uh, and you're just sort of like zeroing in on it for a minute. And um, what I try to do is I try to think of, um, honestly, it's just sort of like what can simultaneously inform the player a little bit about this thing, but also be cool. <laughs> you know? Like um, with flavor text, you don't just want to be like, um, this is the big opera house in this city. It's where the opera takes place. And everyone's just sort of like, okay, you know? But you could instead um, make up a few lines from a famous a famous opera that was performed there, or um, make up a bit of fake history that's just like, oh, does everyone remember when like um, the guy got stabbed at the opera a few years ago? You know, you can kind of take an opportunity to inject a little bit of story into it, or at least a little bit of history, and um, players can then do whatever they want with it. Do you have like a favorite magic card, like flavor text? Do you have one that sits in your mind? Um, all of my favorite magic cards are the really stupid, cheesy joke ones. <laughs> so anything with goblins. <laughs> yeah, like goblin grenade and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, no, there's there's a lot of like really good flavor text in so many games out there, and it's just it's honestly kind of a I feel a little bit bad about how the only stuff that sticks in my head is like the worst possible puns in the history of English, but that's just I mean, who yeah. I am as a person. Isn't Squee everyone's favorite character? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite a favorite one, Alex? I mean, a anything similarly, anything with Squee, really. right? Any, right. Any, yeah, yeah. Well, and Alex, so for on your side of things, I was really, really fascinated by this Red Rising experience for you because Red Rising is a novel. I mean, that's a, a series of novels. That's like a that's a whole story, a whole world that you're having to take. And and I see it really as a challenge of translation, right? You're taking that and translating that into a game experience, which has to be like simulation of a story. You know, not simulation of driving a train or these other things, but of a of a story that happens. What were the challenges that you faced there? Well, so the biggest challenge is honestly there is the game that everyone who reads the Red Rising novels 
thinks they want. Um, and the the fact is that 98% of those people don't actually want that game because that game is like an eight hour, like sprawling multi-table game. And like making a game for people who love the Red Rising novels needs to be a game that's accessible to people who aren't gamers, who who don't want to play that game. Um, or you're, you're really only making it for a very small subset of people. So, so like the, the first challenge was just saying, okay, we are going to disappoint everyone. Uh, and then uh, going through there, it'd be like, okay, so we're going to disappoint everything, one. So what, what element of this world uh, that we're making a game in do we really want to, to bring across? Um, and so in the case of Red Rising, um, the reason I actually came into this game design was because um, Jamie, my, my co-designer and the owner of Stonemaier Games, um, wanted to make a game that really uh, showcase the cast system in this world, which is there are 14 different casts. Um, and finding, he really struggled to find a way to make a game where you could have these 14 different casts and have them all matter. Um, imagine playing a game of poker with 14 suits, um, yes. which is, is essentially what we ended up figuring out a way to do is is a card game. It's it's not, not like poker, but a card game that has 14 different suits. Um, and so Jamie and I kind of came to this like, aha moment together of this is what we can do. And then we're going to make this like this game that showcases this, these people, but all of these other aspects of this world, like there, there is so much cutthroat and backstabbing and just like, do you call it geopolitics? If it's like solar system light, like, you know, uh, political things going on um, and like movement movements of fleets and all of those things that are all mostly abstracted away. Um, and so people, some people are going to come to that game and, and want um, Twilight Imperium um, or some, something large, massive, and that's not what they're going to get. And you kind of have to be okay with that, but at the same time, be sure that you are being true to the story, capturing elements of the story, um, capturing like the themes uh, that are present throughout the story. How, how do you make sure that you are mirroring what is what is what matters in that world. You don't want to, um, you know, you don't want to um, make a if you, you know, take a horror novel. You don't want to make this like lighthearted, like uh, funny, funny experience game out of it, right? Um, and so you have to really think about how how do I match to something that's already existing. Boy, you said a couple things in there that I, I want to follow up on. Um, first of all, as a process question, because you mentioned about, you know, you knew that there was this these, this element of cast that you guys wanted to do, um, and that was a struggle to figure out how to do it. What is the pro what was the process for you guys when you were trying to figure out, you know, how to do that translation? Like, was this a round table discussion? Was it just throwing mechanics at a board and going or what you do? Yeah, so so it's it's really interesting because I was kind of the um, the side person in a lot of that process. Uh, Jamie attempted to design this game four different. I think he made four different games uh, attempting to do this, and he, none of them worked. Um, if you're curious, he has a, a YouTube video about um, uh, just like uh, Stonemaier Games, the game I failed to make um, about uh, about try uh, trying to make Red Rising and failing, um, and ultimately he actually. Um, made this YouTube video and basically said, hey, if anyone else can figure out how to make this, this game, I want to publish it. Um, but at, during this time, I was part um, in Jamie's, well, I still am except for COVID, uh, in Jamie's like regular game group. Uh, and so weekly we would play games and we would talk about things and this would come up and we'd sort of like brainstorm, discuss it, talk about other games that do similar things. Um, and so it happened very naturally over time uh, where we finally like hit on um, another much simpler game, Fantasy Realms, that has uh, 10 suits of cards. Um, and we kind of built off of the idea of this other game. But by the time we were designing it, we already had the answer. Well, I had the same question really for you, Casey, because you talked about this, um, you know, this this game that you'd had this idea for a mechanic, but then, you know, had to come up with kind of a theme around it. You know, what was that process like? Was that similarly, you had to like, you know, spitball a lot of times or really throw a bunch of concepts out? Did you have any crazy concepts that just didn't go work? 
Um, yeah, I mean, in, in a general sense, I'm a big, a uh, big believer in iteration like that and trying lots of, uh, lots of different things and then tweaking small variables and then seeing what works when you tweak those small variables and try like a, a different version of the same thing. But in, in the specific case of, uh, all we have is us, which is the, the game that I did for the golden cobras, um, that one just sort of worked the first time I tried it, which is unusual, and uh, no one listening to this should expect that ever. I just, um, I think I just got very lucky. <laughs> but um, I think, I think a good, a good reason for that is just because um, when you are, when you're working with a very, very unique setting or a very, very unique mechanic, such as uh, timed Zoom calls, uh, you sort of have to think about like what real life situation could we pretend that this is and there aren't a whole lot of real life situations that can be 100% mapped onto zoom calls with a countdown so i just went with real life phone calls with a countdown you know and that was sort of the the direction that it uh sp sprang from there um I was I was actually just gonna be really nosy here. Um, Alex, can I ask you something about the the Red Rising game? Yeah, yeah, of course. Did you keep the dueling? Good question. <laughs> so so the dueling <laughs> is you kind of it's um it's actually depicted on the back of the uh, the board, um, but there's not like an active dueling um element. Like like the gameplay comes down to um on your turn, you are primarily placing a card in one of multiple locations on the board and then picking up a card from a different location. And there are effects that happen, but it's, it's so, so the dueling is once again, would be implied. You could get it, but it's, it's abstracted. That actually that's... takes me. Oh no, go ahead, Casey, go, please. I was just going to say that's, that's totally fair because, um, I, I was thinking about, you know, just when you were talking about the aspects mm. of the story that you are choosing to bring into the game, um, mm. I was really curious as to how something that has such sweeping troop movements and something that is so big and geopolitical, uh, whether or not you'd also kept the really tiny kind of micro conflicts that are present in the mm -hmm. book as well. Um, for, for those of you that haven't uh, read the first book, Red Rising, there is a um, cultural element of dueling uh, in one of the main societies. And there's a, a pretty a pretty prominent spoilery duel scene that I won't go into <laughs> um, great detail about, but it plays yeah. a it plays a big part in the story. And um, I was just kind of bending my brain a little bit, trying to think about how a game might capture all of the big stuff and then those kind of tiny conflicts as well. Um, I, I don't know if you guys uh, ever played the, the the Big Daddy Dune game. But um, that that game goes a long way toward trying to to replicate the experience of uh, of reading Dune in a way that is just masochistic. <laughs> 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 but very no. good. But very masochistic. Yes, yes. Um, I tend to think of Star Wars Rebellion as a game that does a good job of catch capturing like sort of the the overarching like the you said the the troop movements and everything. But also having the moments like through through card plays, basically and missions, um, having those those more direct interactions, those smaller scenes. But there aren't a lot of games that do that. No, I think I well, think that... a, lot of, a lot of games as a as a genre, they try to kind of position themselves as one or the other. Well, and that's and that's kind of where I I wanted to take this next because I you've you've both talked a lot about this this idea of like of simulation really like how do you create that feel of the thing you're trying to place players in the world of the world of Star Wars the world of Dune the world which honestly creating the experience of a painful Dune game might be kind of like reading all the Dune books in one like that might be accurate um, <laughs> but. I, that was kind of my next question for you like what how do you do that like what are some tricks like for let's say there's somebody in the audience who who wants to be a game designer and wants to simulate something what what is your advice for them what's some tricks you can do to try to create a feel um i guess if you're if you're working off an existing uh it feels like such a 
horrible business guy lingo to say like an existing IP, but you know, like if you're, if you're working off an existing story and you want to replicate something that exists in that story, um, my advice would be to think about the moments in that story that wowed you. Like, what was the thing that made you excited to be reading this story? What was the thing that made you excited to be watching this film? What was the uh, the moment where something made you gasp in surprise or something made you go like, oh, that's clever? And then try to figure out how your game might replicate that. Um, I'll, I'll actually use Dune as a, a great example um, because just despite my ragging on the fact that it always takes about seven and a half hours to play, um, Dune has some magical mechanics for that because basically the, the thing about Dune that was absolutely revolutionary as a book when it came out is that um, for the time it was one of the most cerebral kind of like antagonizing forces always thinking ahead of each other and trying to plan one step ahead of the other guys and um in the world of sci-fi uh there hadn't been a whole lot that had been done like it when it came out and um you know you're you're reading this book where every single character has these extremely detailed motivations that sometimes go back generations that stretch back into their cultural history and they're sitting there thinking about all this stuff while they're just like having a conversation with a guy and um, how do you put that into a board game? Because it's one of the most important aspects of Dune, but at the same time, um, having to sit down and read a little lecture about why your dude is making the move that he's making um, sounds like a terrible idea for how to like have fun in person with a group of other people. Um, so what the designers did uh, was they introduced the alliance system where basically, your faction that you're playing as can enter into alliances with other factions and when you enter into alliances with certain other factions you get certain other powers and benefits that are unique to that faction but then of course if you're allied with them you are also beholden to them in certain ways or you are required to come to their aid if they are being you know harassed or in some cases, um, there are certain win conditions that can be disrupted if two people are allowed to ally with each other, or if two people um, are allied with each other, it means that the win conditions for both of their factions change. And so basically the game is forcing you to think about how you ally with people and how you antagonize people in a way beyond just, I wanna help this guy while it's convenient for me, and then I wanna hurt this guy because um, the way the alliance system works is that once you enter into an alliance with someone, you're kind of locked into it for a bit until a certain phase of the game happens. And I just, I really liked that, um, how it forces you to not just do things for quick short-term gain and forces you to consider the longer-term political consequences of your actions. Like that's a really, that's a really kind of zoomed out mechanic for a board game to have, you know, like you have to be thinking about whether or not the fact that your buddies with the Harkonnens is going to like screw you eight turns from now and each turn takes an hour. So you might forget by then, you know? And, uh, and Alex, same question. Yeah. Well, I mean, Casey hit this really well, right? So both, both of those, those like moments and also those overarching things, like figuring out which ones really matter to you for this game. Um, and like, if you're starting to make a, a game based off of uh, a a story, a world, um, an IP, um, chances are that that world is fleshed out enough that there is enough space for like thirty different games. Like, I don't I don't know how, how many Star Wars games have been, there have been, and how many of them were actually good, but there there were probably at least fifteen good Star Wars games, right? Like, uh, so it's okay not to get everything. Um, it's it's okay. You don't need to replicate the the story of the movie or the book or uh, what whatever it is. Uh, you don't need to replicate it like beat beat for beat. Um, but catching finding those moments, finding those those elements about it um, that make you excited about making a game of those things. Um, and sometimes it's it's things like having a single you know having a card that is just completely overpowered because that's that's the deus ex machina character or moment of the game and as long as 
that card is overpowered but works in the context of the game, um, then that's fine. I'm, magic, magic does this really well all the time. Uh, you have so many cards that are just that completely overpowered and broken, and then you have so many ways to counter all those cards. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, or I, I always think of the the Yu-Gi-Oh TV show. Like the, not the game itself is, is is good. It's fine, I'm sure. But like the TV show and the, all these moments of, oh well, you've triggered my trap card, and now you've lost the game. Oh, but wait, now let's, <laughs> you know, five minutes later, you fall in for my trap, and uh, all of those like like catching. What you know? What is this thing that's now overpowered? Like that's fine. And if everything's overpowered, nothing's overpowered. Asymmetrical game design actually has become a pretty big thing recently. I think around mm. that, you know, like Cthulhu Wars. I think about where, you know, how do you make the Elder Gods feel like Elder Gods? They have to all be world ending of their own, you know, on their own right. Right. So, uh, yeah. You know, going back to Dune, uh, the Kwisatz Haderach has to be amazing. Like whatever is the Kwisatz Haderach yeah. has to be amazing, and that's okay as long as everything else is too. Well, and yeah, then going back and like, to, um, oh, go ahead. No, just gonna say, going back to Yu-Gi-Oh, you make me think of those those card holders that people used to carry around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's really taking the game. That's the game influencing life, the story. But no, go ahead, Casey. <laughs> Uh, I, I was just gonna say the the thing the thing that really uh, kind of brings that home to me when I'm just thinking about like games that I've played over the years is like um, whenever someone is the first person to get to level nine in Munchkin and every other person at the table teams up to just like annihilate them and suddenly you've got like this one person who if it's early enough in the game probably isn't that powerful but then you have like these five other people throwing like everything under the sun just to like keep this person from winning and then you look down and it's like this person you know with all their equipment and their level and you know like maybe a couple of like booster cards um you know they're rocking about 32 points and we're just gonna hit you with like 60 points worth of damage because it just matters a lot that you don't win right now and um I, I really, I really love uh, games that allow you to just be completely over the top like that. It's very, um, it's very satisfying, and it's even more satisfying when someone actually manages to pull a win out from a situation like that because they have the, you know, I'm countering your trap card with my, I'm just putting this one back in the deck, or like they have that, um, that one card in the, I think it's the. Spaghetti Western Munchin, uh, Munchkin expansion that's just called Ride Off Into the Sunset, where like you can just play that card and just ride off into the sunset and win. <laughs> it's just like, because <laughs> that's what cowboys do, right? <laughs> you know? Well, and, and tying this all back to storytelling is all of those are allowing the people around the table to make a story of their experience, right? Like, like you're thinking about that at Munchkin is that's an experience. That's something you then remember and you want to talk with each other about. Remember that time that I did whatever it is I did. I rode off into the sunset. <laughs> well, and I and I'm if anybody has questions on the uh, Discord, please post them now. We've got about we're on our last seven minutes or so. Um, but as I don't see any right now, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going with some stuff that you guys have have brought up. Um, uh, th this idea of um, I want to stick with some of this this thought about somebody who like maybe some of these new game designers or somebody out there in the crowd who might be watching this on YouTube or whatever wanting to build their own game is it do you think it's um, important for them to stick to tried and true game mechanics and then use like kind of mix and match or feels like a story to them or do you think people should really try to build their own unique mechanic to tell a story. I feel like uh, it depends on what your goal is. I, uh, I am a person who very much believes that before you decide what you are going to do, before you sit down to make a thing, you should decide what your goal is. Why are you making the thing? If you are designing a game so that you have a fun game that you can play with your friends and maybe chuck up on you know, a website for people to download for pay what you want, or just something that you're going to put up for free online, um, then I don't think you should follow any shoulds at all. I think you should do what sounds interesting to you and what you think could engage people and what you want to experience and what you want to experiment with. Um, I will say if you are wanting to get into card or board game design commercially, 
there are definitely some shoulds you should follow simply because um, you are going to have to play by the rules of make making a game that other people will want to pay money for. And so if it's too unrecognizable or too weird or too abstract or too granular or um, any number of scary sounding words, then <laughs> you may find that your commercial success is quite limited just because um, I, I like to say that people, people don't necessarily always want just variations on the same thing, but they they like things that remind them of other things they like, at least in one or two small ways. And you can do things that are completely unique, and you can sell games that have never been made before. You can make brand new, weird, crazy outsider art games. Um, those are always my favorite games at Indiecade. Um, but if you are wanting to do it for a living, or if you are wanting to sell your work to a publisher, you will have to keep in mind that um, they will want it to at least be recognizable as a uh, an analog to something that exists enough that they can at least pitch it to consumers or to uh, you know funders or basically you you just you don't want to you don't want it to be a blob you want it to be a sphere or a square or you want it to be a shape that they can recognize uh, so that they can say. If you liked this, you might like this. And Alex, to you, yeah. Yeah, no, that those are really good points. Um, and for like, if you are, I mean, if you are pitching to a publisher, essentially you are going to be sending them, I mean, today it might be online, but um, generally you're, you're making a prototype of the game with, you know, cheap pieces and mailing it to them with some rules. And so this has to be something that that person will understand and like be able to play through and the question is will they think it's fun um so part of that is doing your your um your research on the person you're pitching your game to um but as far as yeah as far as just um i mean and part of it is like if you have a what is actually a brand new mechanic that is like no one's ever done before if it's fun. If random strangers say it's fun, then pitch it. Like I'm, I'm going to say, it's going to be easier for a an established publisher to sell than for you as a nobody to get on Kickstarter or and um, convince people to spend money on uh, having not seen it and not knowing anything about you. Um, and but ultimately, you're making a game because you want to make a game like like very few people are there's probably a couple dozen people in the world who are making a full time like income on game design um so so do what's fun for you not what you think is going to make you rich um there there are much better things to do if you want to be rich <laughs> i love that i love that well, I, we, uh, we are on our uh, pretty much out of time i want to end us with a, just a purely fun question um, quick question, um, and that is this. If you could make a game about any story, you got the license to whatever you want, what would it be? Um, start with Alex. Any story out there? Ooh, that is that is hard. Um, there are a lot of really good stories. Um, so this is kind of cheating. Um, so there's a book series called uh, The Deed of Paxinarian uh, by Elizabeth Moon. Uh, this this came out like the late 80s, early 90s. And like I grew up reading these books and they're essentially D&D, &D, um, like D&D &D novels that aren't officially D&D &D novels. And it's like the, the, the concept of the book series is um, how to have a paladin who is like not lawful stupid. <laughs> um, <laughs> and this was like an argument like in the like in the 80s right like uh today when you look at you know D D, whatever uh, paladins you there's lots of examples right. of, of not that but but initially there was this this thing of, of paladins being kind of dumb within their their rule following um and so i just love that book series it was very uh formative for me growing up uh so being able to make a game that brought light to that book series which you know in some ways is just could just be D&D, &D, but it could be any number of board games. Like, I would love to do that. 
and, and Casey, uh, your answer. Uh, I'm trying to look up what the name of it was specifically. Um, although that honestly, that that paladin answer uh, is fantastic <laughs> for a number of reasons and explains why um, I either tend to love to play paladins when I'm in the mood to play a really enthusiastic moron, or I just can't stand them. So that that lines up with my feelings on the matter. <laughs> we are on closely. our last our last minute. So if you remember the name of that. Um, yes, there was a short story by China Mieville called Reports of Certain Events in London, and um, I would love to design a pathfinding game based on it because it's about feral streets that appear and disappear Ooh. off city maps. Ooh, I love that concept. Ooh, that's, awesome. that's good. All right, well, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight, especially our two panelists. Thank you so much for, for being here. This was a really insightful discussion and to some pieces of the game industry I certainly didn't know about. Um, and uh, and I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the convention. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, it was a pleasure to meet both of you. And um, thank you so much, Jonathan, for uh, wrangling the discussion. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. And thank you so much, Casey. Like, I, I have had so much fun just hearing everything you had to say. And <laughs> I've learned a lot from you today. Yeah, likewise. And thank you both. Take care, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.